Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. John Quackenbush received his doctorate in theoretical physics at UCLA, but soon after he was lured into the exciting work on the Human Genome Project. This was an exceptional opportunity for him to apply his computational background to bioinformatics and genomics, fields that depend on sophisticated analysis of huge amounts of data. Dr. Quackenbush joined the faculty of the Institute for Genomic Research in 1997, where he and his group developed analytical methods he would later define and expand when he joined the faculty of the Harvard School of Public Health in 2005. He was appointed to his current position at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute at the same time. Later, he launched the Center for Cancer Computational Biology there, which he directs and which provides broad-based informatics and computational support to the research community through a collaborative consulting model. Dr. Quackenbush is a leader in the fields of genomics and computational biology. His current research focuses on the analysis of human cancer using systems biology-based approaches to understanding and modeling the biological networks that underlie disease. He and his team have made fundamental discoveries about the role that variation in gene expression plays in defining biological phenotypes. Dr. Quackenbush, we welcome you to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations today. Thank you very much for honoring us with your presence. Um, you are uh, quite a figure in this field of genomics. You've done a lot of things, but you started out, interestingly, in theoretical physics. And I wonder if you could explain for us what that has brought to the field of genomics. Well, uh, first, thank you for having me here. It's really my pleasure. Uh, I always welcome the opportunity to tell people about what I do because um, I really feel indebted to the taxpayers and other people who support the work we do. So thank you for having me. Um, you know, physics, what does physics have to do with genomics? And the, the story can actually be told a number of different ways. What most people don't know is that the Genome Project was actually more or less started by physicists. Um, the Human Genome Project grew out of research that was being done at the Department of Energy yes. and their national laboratories. And the thing about um, physics is that physics has had a long history of large collaborative projects, while biology, until the Genome Project, largely proceeded sort of gene by gene, little incremental steps. Mm -hmm. And it was the convergence of a lot of factors, the end of the Cold War, declining funding for physics research, um, and sort of an explosion, a little mini explosion in technologies that were being developed in biology that got people thinking about how they might apply um, large-scale science to decoding what's hidden in the human genome. So one piece of the story is that um, physics actually kicked the genome project into its start. My personal story um, is a little bit different. I was actually working, uh, doing a PhD in theoretical physics. I had always imagined that, uh, even when I was a little boy growing up, that I would spend my life doing science. I loved scientists, mad scientists in cartoons um, and Batman. And I really, I, I thought that was going to be my life. And I started doing physics because I, it was supposed to be the most challenging subject. Mm -hmm. And um, at the same time physics research was drying up at the end of the Cold War, um, I happened to be dating a biologist and I spent a lot of time in her laboratory and discovered, in, in the same way the physicists starting the Genome Project discovered, I discovered that all these new technologies were being mm. created. Mm -hmm. And so I got very interested. I taught myself enough to be dangerous. And uh, I really started to build an understanding of what the challenges were in biology and how somebody with a good quantitative background mm -hmm 
the, the ability to do mathematics, the ability to write computer programs, how that kind of training and background could contribute to a project like this. Um, as I was finishing my PhD and working through a postdoc and struggling with what I was going to do, um, the Human Genome Project grew into a project that spanned now both the Department of Energy and the National mm -hmm. Institutes of Health. And the NIH realized they needed somebody with quantitative skills. And so uh, they sent out a request for proposals for people with quantitative backgrounds to work on the Genome Project. When they did, um, it seemed like a natural fit for me, and so I applied. And the story is I was one of the first three people to apply. There were two computer scientists and me. I don't think they had any idea what they wanted, so they took one of each, and I happened to be the one. So the only physicist. So I got my start really because of uh, this convergence of factors. But the, the other question you asked is, you know, what does my training bring? Mm -hmm. And I, I think biologists have always looked at individual genes, individual proteins, and that's right. been the history. Right. What I think physicists are very good at is taking problems, breaking them down, and then abstracting right. them. At the system. At the system, exactly. Yeah. And so the real challenge in genomics, I think, is that if we think about the human genome, if we think about the genes, if we think about the proteins, we have parts. But the whole question is how you take those parts exactly. and put them together. Right. And this is systems within systems within systems, <laughs> and you would have a natural uh, kind of uh, uh, perspective for that. And I think that's, that's a big part of what physicists do. Mm -hmm. We build mathematical and theoretical yeah. models. We do large-scale experiments. Yeah. And then you have to connect the dots and figure out how they work and build models sometimes that aren't really the theory, mm -hmm. but the question isn't always, is the model right? It's, is the model useful? Can we use what we're discovering to predict new things right. that we can then test? So you had the modeling kind of mind for Mentality. a set, the <laughs> mindset for this kind of a thing, and you could make quite a contribution. I think that we're not in the public generally aware of how important physics is becoming for things like molecular biology today, but it is. It's a, and you said, so it's one of these very interesting convergences in, the, in science today. I'd like to ask about bioinformatics. I, we get all these new terms all the time, and uh, so we might be aware that we need very complex ways of collecting data and analyzing data of this sort. Can you explain what this sort of field is? Sure. Uh, bioinformatics um, has been described as many things. It's sort of at the convergence between computer science yeah. and statistics and biology. Um, and I've actually had people try to fit me into a Venn diagram with all three of those things, and I'm not sure I fit into any of them. Uh, but uh, bioinformatics is really, I think, focused on the application of advanced computational methods yeah. to help collect, manage, analyze, and interpret the data that we're generating. And the, the reason it becomes so important is goes back to what I was talking about, about putting things together. Mm -hmm. How do we take information and put it together? How do we organize data so that we can interpret what we're seeing when we look at an organism, when we look at its components, when we look at its genes? And that often requires that we pull in information from other sources. But even the primary data is big. Okay? The unit that we use for measuring DNA is the base or the base pair. Mm -hmm. And we actually have two more or less identical we can talk about what that means at some mm -hmm. point, mm -hmm. copies of the human genome right. in every one of our cells. The size of one of those copies is three billion bases. Mm -hmm. okay. Now that's, that's a number that you know, I struggle with, right? It's slightly larger than my salary, slightly smaller than the <laughs> national debt, um, but it's, you know, it's a big number. And if you want to put it into context, three billion is the number of seconds in 95 years. Okay. That is scary. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's an extraordinary amount of information. We have, you know, 190 years worth of DNA second by second mm -hmm. in our mm -hmm. genomes. So we have this large body of even primary data if we want to look at our own DNA um, to sort through. But then if we really want to understand what it means, we have to think about not only the DNA but the proteins. We have to think about what we know about disease and changes in DNA. We have to think about drugs interacting with genes yes. if we want to try to put them together to try to better cure disease. So we have this complex problem of 
organizing information, finding links, building models. And um, just the ability to use these computational tools, to use statistics, um, to think about designing experiments and linking information together has really, I think, proven invaluable for advancing our understanding of the genome. Right. There's, that would be a very interesting field for people mathematically inclined to go into and something that people interested in sort of more the biology but not the mathematical have to learn a little bit about. But it's very, very exciting, this well, field. You know, even, even simple questions like, uh, if we look at very complex data, how do we visualize yes, that data? Right. How do we take this enormous amount of information and make it so your physician can understand what True. it means? True. Right? I mean, there are just so many questions. So uh, really, uh, people who work in bio bioinformatics tend to have a broad range um, of sure. backgrounds and skills. Right. I bet they do. Um, I would like to ask you now about the Human Genome uh, Project, and I want to take the opportunity to say I read all of the popular books on these. When people do this, uh, when scientists make the effort to uh, produce books for a general lay public or non-specialist, I have read them. So this is the best one, absolutely, for uh, on many things. It's uh, multiple levels for one thing, but one of the very fine things about it is it explains just why you go from one organism to another organism what, and before you start getting to humans and just how complicated a gene is. So if I may ask you about the project, some, a couple of clarifications first. Sure. What's a gene and what's a genome, just to make that clear? So uh, the idea of a gene is actually sort of an old idea, yeah, and you can trace it back a variety of different ways, but you know, sort of the starting point is the biology most of us remember from high yes, school, yeah. right? Gregor Mendel and the mm -hmm. peas. And um, Mendel was actually really interested in understanding how traits get passed from one generation to the next. It's a question we all think about. If we have children, we always say, oh, you know, he has my eyes and your hair and That's exactly grandma's right. teeth, yes. right? The same way Mendel was looking at plants, and he mm -hmm. said, well, you know, plants also have this phenomenon. Traits pass and mix across generations. And so he started to look at how these traits are passed and really hit on the idea that uh, based on his observations that these traits actually were passed with some kind of definable mathematical relationship. They either were passed um, directly from one generation to the next or they combined across generations, but he could define that based on looking at these mathematical relationships. And I, I mentioned earlier, we know we have two copies of the genome in our cells, and it really was that observation of Mendel that suggested mm -hmm. we that offspring have two copies of their parents' traits that somehow combine. And distilled out of this sort of through Thomas Hunt Morgan mm -hmm. um, a few years later working with um, Drosophila, the fruit fly. Fruit flies. Right? <laughs> we discovered there too that traits get passed from one generation mm -hmm. to the next. And the idea was that these traits are carried by something that we call genes. And the definition of genes has changed and meandered over time, but the essential element is that a gene is a unit of heredity, an, an, a heritable object to get, that gets transferred from one generation to the next. Okay. Our modern understanding often, although not always, is that those genes are actually pieces of DNA. Mm -hmm that encode uh, a protein. So if you think about a human cell or any other cell, the cell is like a little machine. It's a machine that's made of proteins. And all those proteins and other things have to function together. And so the traits often can be um, linked to these proteins. And so the traits often are linked to the genes that contain the blueprints for proteins. Mm -hmm. So a gene is a unit of heredity. A gene is also typically or often described as um, an element of the cell, a piece of DNA that has the blueprint for a protein. Okay. Okay? So the other question you asked was, what's a genome? Right. Well, <coughs> the easiest definition of a genome is that a genome is sort of the collection of all of the genes. Now, where the genes were stored in a cell was an open question for a long period of time. And again, there's sort of a long history of how we get to our modern understanding of where the genes are stored. But 
Our understanding today is that the genes are stored primarily in DNA. This deoxyribonucleic acid, the, the molecule whose structure was decoded uh, by Watson and Crick. Mm -hmm. And DNA has some very interesting properties that help uh, define how traits and, and DNA uh, patterns can be transmitted from one generation to the next. But the DNA actually encodes the genes. And so if we look at a human, a human has about 25,000 genes encoded in these three billion bases of DNA. So if you think about 25,000 versus three billion, they're both big numbers, but it turns out that the genes are only about 1% mm. of all of the <laughs> DNA in a cell. So the, uh, the Genome Project started with people at the Department of Energy saying, well, you know, we have these genes. We're trying to hunt for them. We're trying to find them. They're so hard to find because there's such a tiny portion of this enormous amount of DNA that we know is in the cell. Let's just take the DNA. Let's take it all. And let's make a roadmap of that entire mm -hmm. DNA, the genome. And then use that roadmap as a way to understand which pieces are these blueprints for proteins, which mm -hmm. pieces encode traits that get passed from one generation to okay, the next. Okay, great. And then the next thing that happened was the discovery that the genes themselves don't, or maybe not the whole story. And I think the term junk DNA is familiar enough now, but what is it and what's so important? So um, if you look at a, a bacteria, a bacteria is microscopic, uh, e. coli, which is a bacteria we read about a lot, most E. coli um, are benign. In fact, uh, there's evidence that suggests that without E. coli in our digestive tracts, um, our, our digestive tracts may not develop properly, uh, but they play a big role actually in helping us digest our own food. So E. coli have been incredibly important um, as um, uh, a symbiotic organism with yes. humans. Uh, e. coli has, have been incredibly important as a laboratory model for understanding the basics for genetics, for understanding the connection between genes and their genome. Now our genome is about three billion DNA units or bases in length. The E. coli genome is a little bit less than five million, okay? So it's much, much smaller, mm -hmm. uh, almost a thousand times smaller. And it, uh, uh, almost 1,000. If you look at this E. coli genome, E. coli has about 6,000 genes. And the, the genes are really tightly packed. Yeah. And mm -hmm. part of the reason is that E. coli has to divide very rapidly. The strategy of many microbes, many um, viruses and bacteria is that in order to survive and adapt, they have to grow and divide very mm -hmm. rapidly. So their genomes are very, very efficient in dividing. The information is stored in a very, very efficient way. But as more complex organisms evolved, what happened is the genomes grew, they duplicated, um, viruses actually God. inserted <laughs> their DNA into our genomes yeah. to sort of ride along. Um, our cells developed strategies to sort of knock those viruses out but didn't get rid of them, and so our genomes grew in size. Mm -hmm. And what we've come to understand now is our genes are only about 1% of the genome. There's all this other DNA that we carry along. And we're really trying to sort out why we carry that. Does it give us some evolutionary advantage? Does it simply slow down cell growth uh, so that um, we live longer? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. think anyone knows. But that's one of the real questions we're trying to understand is what all of this DNA that isn't genes, what it does. One of the things we've come to recognize, though, is that often encoded in the regions between the genes that were cataloged by the Human Genome Project, there are other elements, and those elements are like switches. Yes. They help turn genes on and off, and they actually provide a means by which these genes can interact with each other in interesting ways, uh, through which the genes can interact with other elements in the cell. They provide structure for the DNA. They help to regulate how genes are turned on and off, and so we've come to realize that the non-genes in the DNA in many ways can be as important as the genes in terms of helping us to understand what happens. Yes. Would that have anything to do uh, with the 
uh, idea of epigenetics, where, which seems to be a more rapid, if you have mutations, those take a long time, uh, generation after generation, to get kind of what's stabilized or something to make a stable change. But in, there's an interest evidently in epigenetics. Is that related, well, what is it? And is it related in any way, do you think, to junk DNA, which, or it's unknown? Well, no, I, I think we're, we're getting a much better understanding mm -hmm. of um, epigenetics. So epigenetics generally refers to all of the things which aren't DNA, mm -hmm. uh, which regulate how genes are turned on and off, okay? And you know, this is sort of an interesting problem. Like our cells have 25,000 genes, but a liver cell and a kidney cell or a brain cell should all be doing slightly different jobs, right? They have to do some of the same things. They have to digest sugar. They have to consume mm -hmm. oxygen. They, there's a basic metabolism that they carry out, which is very similar to that in E. coli, bacteria, or yeast, or almost anything else living. So they're, they're sort of basic processes, but we know in most of us, we hope, that a brain cell and a liver cell are doing something different, mm -hmm. right? And so if the genes are sort of the blueprints for the parts for the cell, we have to have different parts in a brain cell and different parts in a liver cell, which means that the DNA has to be switched on and off differently. Right. And so the whole question of how that DNA gets switched on and off is really what we study when we study epigenetics. The father of epigenetics was a man named Conrad Waddington, mm. and he was studying Drosophila, the fruit mm -hmm. fly. And he asked a question which is relevant to us, too. If you take a single fertilized egg, right, that egg has the same DNA as every mm -hmm. organ in your body. How does that one egg divide to become an eye cell or a foot mm -hmm. cell or mm -hmm. a digestive tract cell? And his answer was there had to be something else which is regulating this, and, and that's epigenetics. So we're, we're coming to understand that there's almost a second genetic code, this epigenetic right. code, which helps regulate how genes turn on and off. And it actually, you might think, okay, well, it's just regulation in our, our developing in adult cells. But in fact, we find that even with things that we think of classically like mutations, we have a mm -hmm, mutation mm -hmm, in a particular mm -hmm. gene, in some instances, there are diseases where if you inherit a mutation from your mother or you inherit the mutation from your father, mm -hmm. those mutations are expressed differently mm -hmm. and cause different diseases. And that's because in the sperm and the egg, the methylation patterns, the epigenetic modifications mm -hmm. are different. Very interesting. So um, what epigenetics does is actually sort of moderate the effects of the genome, control the effects, but it also does something else that's really interesting. One of the things it helps to do is help to increase the variability. So that when you think about Mendel, right, and mm -hmm, the way we learned mm -hmm, genetics mm -hmm. in high school, the peas were either smooth or wrinkly, mm -hmm. right? But there's not just one kind of wrinkle and one kind of smooth, there's a continuum. Mm -hmm. And what we've really come to understand is that these other factors help spread out the traits help cause some variation. And variation is actually good, mm -hmm. right? If we were absolutely. all, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, if we're all the we, same, yes. right, we'd be in trouble. Yes. And so um, throughout the history of humans evolving on Earth, having some spectrum of variation is probably something that helped us adapt and survive. Yeah, it's a very interesting whole new area, I guess, emerging area where they can actually, because of the kind of work that you do with the bioinformatics, you can really penetrate this a lot better because it's so uh, huge, the data that you need and so forth is so well, huge. Data is, is, is absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. if, so again, coming back to physics, if you look back at the transition in physics that happened, Statistical mechanics, quantum mechanics, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. modern physics grew up in the late 1800s mm -hmm. when new technologies allowed us to generate data. In genomics, in biology, genomics has given us that renaissance. Yes, exactly. You wouldn't, the technology is very much a partner with it, isn't it? The technology and the, uh, yes, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to penetrate this kind of information today without all of this. Our understanding of our place in the universe was driven by data. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So it, it, I imagine that we'll, we'll see more of this like maybe in school programs and stuff, but it's, it's reorienting clearly the way that we 
think in a modern culture today, and I'll come back to that shortly. Before we leave this, as far as the Human Genome Project uh, is concerned, um, you discuss in your book sort of the transition from one organism to another in terms of research material. And uh, I think that sometimes people are confused, well, why on earth would you use fruit flies or E. coli or something like that when you're talking about us spiffy humans? <laughs> and uh, can you explain that for us a little bit? Why do you use these things? You sort of alluded to it in a way, but I'd like to get it clear. Sure. There, there are a lot of reasons why these model organisms are so important. And we call them model organisms because they really are models for the processes that happen in humans. Mm -hmm. um, and again, there are often a couple ways to look at this. One of them is evolutionarily. Okay, um, we, you know, didn't appear as fully formed humans um, out of nothing. We have a long history dating back to the first organisms on Earth, and those first organisms were microbes. And those microbes had to adapt and survive. They had to deal with uh, generating energy. Um, either through converting sunlight to energy or other sources of chemical energy into biological energy or uh, through digesting um, things in their environment. Mm -hmm. And they evolved processes. They developed genes that allowed them to do these things. And those traits gave them an advantage. They allowed them to survive. And essentially, once nature invents a way to do something, it doesn't want to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. the, the systems that we use to do very basic things like carry on respiration, yeah. Um, and carry on uh, basic metabolism, yeah. right? Digesting sugar um, are virtually identical if we look at our cells or a bacterial cell. As organisms became more complex and developed nuclei, packages that held the DNA safe from the rest of the cell, um, they had to develop new systems. And so uh, organisms like yeast mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. contain many genes that aren't in bacteria mm -hmm. but are similar to genes in us. And the amazing thing is that some of those genes, uh, if you look at the corresponding gene in humans, are involved in things like neurological diseases, yeah. right? And you know, yeast doesn't have a what mind. What does the yeast have to <laughs> right? do with it exactly? It doesn't have a mind, <laughs> right. we hope. Uh, but you know, these genes are carrying on roles in the cell. Mm -hmm. And if a process is breaking down in our brain cells, and we can look at yeast and understand what that gene is doing, we may gain insight into how to better yeah. diagnose or treat a disease in humans. If we look at things like yeast, it doesn't really develop digestive systems or neurological systems, but Drosophila does, the fruit fly. Yeah. And so if we look at more and more complex organisms, we can start to understand the processes that are involved in making organisms like us. Right. So they've been an invaluable laboratory for exploring um, what happens in our cells what happens in our bodies, what happens in the human organism. You pointed out also that once you get into something as complex as the human genome, it really gets kind of messy. You don't know where something begins and ends, or it does. it's not located over here where you thought it was going to be located and so on. And I think we think of this as a nice, tight little map. And what you see on documentaries is the little tracks with the colors. And it looks like it's all there, but we don't understand uh, as on the lay side, necessarily, the complications of these decoding these things and where they begin and end. That's kind of a surprise. Is, can you give an idea of the difficulty of analyzing the human genome in that respect? Well, you, know, it, you could imagine traveling across the country and being given a road map with no roads. The, and no there cities, you are. That's right? well done. Yes. So you've got a uh, almost a blank slate. We have three billion bases of DNA, yeah. right? And if we were to travel along, we know what properties of roads are, right? If there are a bunch of trees in front of you, you're not on a road. Um, but you know, sometimes actually figuring out where those roads go, whether one's a dead end, yes, right. is still a challenge. You have to look. You have to look at its properties. You have to travel some distance. In the same way, when we were looking at the human genome. We were saying, all right, well, we have three billion bases. Let's try to find the genes. And in bacteria, the genes are compact. Essentially, mm -hmm. a string of DNA mm -hmm. that has mm -hmm. uh, the code for a protein is something we would consider as a gene. 
And there mm -hmm. may be other things, units of heredity, mm -hmm. but the string of DNA is, is our first pass definition of a gene. If you look in these uh, more complex organisms, the genes tend not to be just a continuous right, string, but they tend to be broken up into fragments. And the reasons for that is because sometimes the fragments can be put together in different ways, so it gives us more flexibility mm -hmm. as organisms. So even though we have 25,000 genes, there are more possibilities for how we put them together. But because the system is not just so simple, finding these genes is much mm -hmm. harder. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have the challenge of just finding those genes, finding what we think are genes. But you know, beyond that, too, even if we had that catalog of genes, we don't know what they all do. Right. The genes often have multiple roles. Yeah. They play multiple purposes. And so uh, you, know, you were asking about bioinformatics earlier. Part of what we need to do is to understand if people carry a particular trait, a particular variation in the gene, can we associate it with the disease? Right. Or can we associate uh, a spectrum of different variations with a particular disease. And you almost couldn't do it without bioinformatics. It's just impossible on the back of an envelope, I guess. Yes. Exactly. It's like you know, trying to add up, trying to do your taxes with paper and pencil versus right. you know, having this a program. Is worse. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Only it's, it's much, much right. more complicated right. even than doing right. your taxes. Well, I appreciate that it's because I think it isn't, uh, isn't clear to most of us that it really is messy when you get in there. Uh, and that as the organisms get be increasingly complex, you get this other stuff uh, in there also. More possibilities, but more stuff to well, confuse you. And what makes it even harder is we, when we first started this, we used to think that, oh, we look for a change in yeah. a gene, an alteration yeah. in the, the piece that encodes a protein. Yes. And that alteration may make a slightly different protein. That protein may do a slightly different job in the cell, and so that can cause disease. But we're starting to uncover more mutations, more yes. variation right. in the non-coding DNA, what you call the junk DNA, right. that we can trace back to disease. Right. And that may be that you're not necessarily making the wrong protein, but you're making the right protein in the wrong place or at the wrong yeah. time. Right? right? Water's wonderful, but if your car is filled yeah, with water, right. it's not it's a, a good different thing. thing altogether. Right. I'd like to switch now to a little bit to your uh, uses of the, the genome. You are uh, famous for your work on cancer, a couple of uh, cancers. Um, could you explain, like, how you treat this? You describe the cancer as very in an interesting way here. Again, I'm not sure it's a widespread that we know it in a widespread way. If you could explain what it is, as you explained it here, you know, as not just one thing, but also your work along those lines, what you'd like to get out of your research on that. Well, what, what I'd like to get out of my research is, is really um, the ability to understand how cells work. Mm -hmm. Right? And sort of the physicist in me saying, I want to understand the universe. Exactly. Now I understand the universe <laughs> within. Um, and you know, we actually have much more data in humans um, to be able to study that in diseases like cancer. Right? The, you often find out um, about how a system works by changing it. Mm -hmm. right? If things are working well, you don't often learn something. But if you change it in subtle right. ways, right? that's the basis of doing an experiment. Right. You perturb a system and you, you look at how it responds. Yeah. And cancer is a way of perturbing or sort of pushing normal human cells in the wrong direction. So it's been an incredible laboratory for studying questions in basic biology. Hmm. We have much more data on cancer than almost anything else. And I, as I was writing this book, I actually thought about it because um, I, was, I was really trying to understand why that was, right? Heart disease kills more people than mm -hmm. cancer does. But if you look at cancer, the way in which we treat cancer is generally different than the way in which we treat heart disease. Mm -hmm. If you have heart disease, you go to your doctor, you say, please fix me, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I want to save my heart. Mm -hmm. If you have cancer, the first thing you do is you go to your physician, and you say, cut this out of me, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And so we have this diseased tissue that right. in some ways, because patients, and I'm very grateful to the patients who consent to be part of research studies, they really are partners in, in mm -hmm. understanding disease because they allow us to use their tissue to do experiments. So. Um, cancer has really been a, a, a good laboratory for understanding um, 
human biology. And what we hope to be able to do is, is to use what we learn to help cancer patients survive the disease better, have better quality of life. So what is cancer? Cancer is basically cells growing out of control, right? It's almost an evolutionary experiment yeah. running in your body, right? You have cells which are carrying on their normal functions. And in, in the course of our lifetimes, our cells pick up DNA damage. There are a lot of different reasons, the exposure to ultraviolet mm -hmm. light for skin cells, uh, oxidizing compounds that we consume, um, metals that we may uh, consume in our diet that bind DNA. There are all sorts of things that can cause damage to our mm -hmm. DNA. And our cells actually have exquisite mechanisms for repairing that damage, but you know, it's like fixing a broken plate. A lot of times you can put it together, but sometimes you don't do it right. The same thing happens with DNA in our cells. And so the cells start to accumulate damage. There's some mutations, uh, variants of genes that predispose people to getting cancer. And those very often are genes that are associated with repairing DNA. Um, but the cells start to accumulate more and more damage. And eventually, they reach a state in which a transformation happens. Because they have enough new variants, new changes in their DNA, that the cells start to grow out of control. Mm -hmm. And as they do, they tend to pick up more and more mutations, uh, particularly for solid tumors. So what we would like to really be able to do is, in some sense, to understand the evolutionary history of these tumors. We'd like to understand what the early stage mutational events are mm -hmm. so that we can try to do better early detection. Mm -hmm. And again, we're developing lots of new technologies that allow us to do that. The cells, as they grow, often fall off a cliff and die, in a mm -hmm, sense. Mm -hmm, Some of them do. Mm -hmm. And their DNA, or an RNA, a related mm -hmm, molecule, mm -hmm, gets mm -hmm. um, shed into the bloodstream. And we're developing technologies that allow us to look in the bloodstream for mutations. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. We're developing technologies that allow us to look for tumor cells that have escaped and are circulating in the bloodstream. We have more and more ways to sort of look for these early mutational mm -hmm. events if we know what they are. Mm -hmm. So one piece of the puzzle is to try to find Fine. these events. But the other thing that uh, I think we're starting to learn is that if we think about cancer, we think about breast cancer. We think, oh, it's just one disease, right? It's breast cancer. Uh, because we associate the tumor with the, the location where it's growing. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, what we're coming to understand is that what we thought of as a single disease really isn't. So breast cancer. Uh, is probably the best example of a disease where genomics has really given us profound insight into the disease mm. in ways that are having impact on patients. Um, so the first thing we've learned is that there are probably at least three or four different subtypes of breast cancer. And those subtypes are defined by the same basic things that make a liver cell different from a brain cell. Mm different genes are turned on and off, right? So we switch on one set of genes or another set of genes, and it makes what we would look uh, under the microscope and see as one type of tumor, mm -hmm. really, at the molecular level, different types of tumors. One of the primary um, differences between different breast cancer subtypes is the expression of a gene called the estrogen receptor gene. Estrogen is an mm -hmm, important mm -hmm, hormone, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in women. It governs the menstrual cycle, plays a very important role in um, you know, childbirth. Uh, but one of the things it actually does is it helps modify breast tissue. Right? Mm -hmm, if a woman is going mm -hmm, to have a child, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. has to prepare to breastfeed, right? mm -hmm. um, the breasts grow in size. And then after the child's wean, the breast shrinks. Mm -hmm. The hormones, like estrogen and progesterone, actually regulate those mm -hmm. changes in the mm -hmm. cells. Mm -hmm. So breast cancer cells are programmed to respond to estrogen. Mm -hmm. Now, in a tumor, the same thing happens. The cells need some signal to tell them to grow. And one of those signals, typically, is estrogen. And so what we discover is that uh, one of the big classes of breast tumors are those that have learned to respond to estrogen. So we have estrogen receptor positive tumors mm -hmm. and estrogen receptor negative tumors, the tumors that have learned to grow without estrogen saying smart. grow, 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 yes, right? right? So they're, in some ways, the, the bad guys, the estrogen receptor negative tumors, are more evolutionarily yes. advanced. They've That's escaped amazing. the need for the message. Right. But if we know the tumors are ER positive, estrogen mm -hmm, receptor mm -hmm, positive, mm -hmm. we actually have drugs like Taxol that will block 
those signals. I see. Okay? In the same way, if we look at the estrogen receptor positive tumors, we've discovered another um, receptor on the surface of the cells, um, a, a gene called HER2 that's expressed. Mm -hmm. And there's a drug now that shuts down those signals, a drug called Herceptin. Okay? So we're starting to take these diseases and dissect them into subtypes. And as we do that, we can start to develop therapies that target these subtypes. Right. Right? And that's one of the things that's really exciting about having access to tissue, having access to the data we can generate, and having access to the tools where we can start to make these connections. Yes. I'm just thinking that as another sort of byproduct of that is that it really gives you some insight into evolutionary processes, doesn't it? That something so negative can work so fast, and uh, it's like a like a little arms race there, cancer and and the medical community that's after it. But there are arms races all over it's in true. biology. It's true. This is true. Viruses evolving to. Um, you know, tumors trying to escape chemotherapy. And Ex you know, I do a lot of work on ovarian cancer. One of the huge yeah. problems there is the tumors rapidly become resistant to chemotherapy. Yes. So they, they're, they're smarter than the rest of the, <laughs> the, of the body, evidently. But it, I think that they are, will shed a great deal of light just on biology pro in general down the line, huh? The, um, I want to ask you about what you know now about these hereditary things, and there's the case through the breast cancers, ovarian cancers, uh, some of these cancers that clearly seem to have a hereditary uh, pattern. Do you have anything, like, can you explain what's happening there is in terms of, can you identify the gene yet or anything like that? So, in some cancers, we know that particular mutations increase your risk. And um, it sort of harkens back to things we talked about earlier with epigenetics, mm -hmm. um, with just variation in stochastics, right? There, there are random events that occur. And so we're coming to understand that there are very few diseases, even outside of cancer, that are um, linked in a deterministic way to a particular mutation, right? They're, diseases like cystic fibrosis, mm -hmm, where if you mm -hmm. inherit a mutated form of the gene, you're almost certainly going to develop the disease. Most other diseases, if you inherit a mutated form of a particular gene, what it does is it increases your likelihood mm -hmm. of developing a particular disease. Mm -hmm. So um, in breast cancer, there are two genes that have been identified, BRCA1 yes. and BRCA2. and um, if you carry mutations in those genes, it increases substantially mm -hmm. your risk for developing cancer. So even knowing about those genes, what we can do now is do a test. If you have a family history of developing breast cancer, we can do a test to see whether or not in your family that history is linked to the presence of that gene. We can discover whether or not you carry that gene. If you do, number one, it gives you information that you can use to help your children understand their risk for disease. But number two, what it does is it can put you on alert. Mm -hmm. It can tell you that, well, you have to be particularly careful about monitoring your health, monitoring uh, the status of changes in the breast tissue to see whether or not those changes are potentially cancerous. Right. So it, it's additional information about your relative risk. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of what genetics is able to do as we, as we start to look at disease. The, the challenge, though, is that often it's not just a mutation or a variation in one gene, but back to the idea of systems, mm -hmm. that these genes are actually part of a, a almost a wiring diagram. And a little change in one gene may not knock it out, but it may slightly change the way in which that circuit, that genetic circuit functions. Then it may take two or three hits. Mm -hmm. And it, most of the models of cancer are not one gene that's mutated, but multiple genes. Right. It's a multi-hit process. You have to break the system in, in a variety of different ways to get it to turn into a cancer. So if you carry mutation, you're further along that path. Right? So your risk is higher than someone else. But in, in everyone, what has to happen 
is the right combinations of genes and environmental exposure and luck have to play into your developing the disease. Exactly. But again, I'm, dr I'm drawn by your, uh, your background, which would kind of put you in such a good position to look at it systemically, that, to look at it as a, as a one little thing here has an effect over here, right? So that you're well set to un analyze that. Well, but. some of the, the things we're working on now, which aren't in this book, are mm -hmm. actually looking at mm -hmm. variation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the really interesting things we've recognized, and it's probably not, um, uh, you know, it shouldn't be a surprise, but you know, you get, you get sort of caught in a way of thinking about things. When we do experiments, we always look at what happens on average. Mm -hmm. And what I think we're starting to realize more and more is that what happens on average probably isn't the most interesting. Oh, how in, yeah. The really interesting thing is what happens far from average, mm -hmm. right? Because your liver doesn't turn into mm -hmm. a liver tumor. Right. It's one cell that yes, wanders I off see. the beaten path, <laughs> right? right? So the yeah. bad guys yes. are the ones that aren't doing what they're supposed to be right. doing. Right, and they're more interesting every time, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but more on that another time then because that's a, a whole area. I hope you will be pursuing that because the, certainly you, it seems like the whole field is beginning to look at is in a position maybe to look at things in a more complex way. Uh, and uh, I'm sure it will only get more interesting. That, though, raises the question that you deal with here quite a bit, and that is the impact or of this kind of knowledge on the way that we think today. So you think about how often people say, oh, it's genetic, <laughs> right? My sniffles are genetic, my everything is genetic. And so it has just reshaped our mentality. What do you think of that? And how do you think that these, this kind of knowledge is shaping the way we think? Well, you know, it, it's, it's really, it's interesting. I, I think it, it really emphasizes the fact that um, we're much more alike than mm -hmm. we tend um, to believe. You look around a room and you see men and women, you see people with light skin and dark skin, tall and short, dark eyes, light eyes. I mean, you pick almost any trait. And I think evolutionarily, we're programmed to find people like us, mm -hmm. right? And to pick out differences. We want to find things that are different. And that may have been an advantage at some point for recognizing who you can trust, who you can't trust. But if you look at our DNA, the difference between any two of us mm -hmm. is less than one-tenth of one percent, okay? And that's extraordinary, right? And if you really think about it, you've, if you throw out those, you know, phenotypic differences, the, the outward appearance, right? We all can eat the same food, we breathe the same air, I have O negative blood, right? I can give anybody a blood transfusion, right? They can use my blood, right? If I met a woman of the right age with bad taste in men, you know, potentially we could have a <laughs> child. Um, and so, you know, and these, it, it wouldn't matter what she looked like, mm -hmm. right? What mm -hmm. her outward exactly. appearance was, her skin, eyes, Whether hair. Whether she's Neanderthal. No, maybe not. <laughs> um, and so, you know, at this very fundamental level, our genomes are telling us that we're very, very closely related. It's told us about our evolutionary history mm -hmm. and just looking at patterns of variation in our DNA. We know that humans have emerged in Africa and came out of Africa mm -hmm. about 170,000 years ago. We can trace migration patterns across the globe. We can see that men and women actually followed slightly different migration patterns by looking at the Y chromosome, mm -hmm, which only men mm -hmm, have, mm -hmm. or mitochondrial mm -hmm. DNA, which come from mothers to offspring. Mm -hmm. And so we learn a lot about ourselves and our history from looking at DNA. But we also learn about our place in the continuum of yes. life, right? Mm -hmm. The difference between a human and a chimpanzee is about 0.4 percent, okay? And the numbers are, you know, are a little sloppy, but you know, somewhere yeah. less than 1 percent. We should start treating them better. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. The difference in our genes between us and a mouse is about 15 percent, yes. okay? They're Treat about 85 percent. No more mouse traps. Right? <laughs> exactly. So, and, you know, if you look across the continuum of life on Earth, what we really discover is that we are just one piece in this enormous tapestry dating back to the earliest organisms. 
where you know we really owe them uh, in some sense a debt of gratitude for learning how to digest sugar, learning how to consume <laughs> Absolutely. oxygen. Absolutely, be nice to E. Be coli. Ni <laughs> be nice to E. coli. They're, they're our great, 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 many time removed. Exactly, but it shows that just that linkage all the way back there, and the uh, I think in a way that says you have to pay attention to this now. True, true, and I'm sure that there's a great deal more to be learned. In in terms of your the future, your future projects, is there anything you'd like to tell us before <laughs> we close up here? Uh, <laughs> how much do you want to hear? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you put the gen the genome together with the universe, a little dark matter, a little, <laughs> all this stuff, and you come out with something. What are you going to do here? So I, I think there are a lot of opportunities. Mm -hmm. So um, my, my research really is focused on uh, the idea that what we want to do is to take these pieces of the puzzle that we're now able to generate and to figure out how to put them together, to mm -hmm. take all the parts and put them together into a wiring diagram. And it's a whole new area of biological inquiry called systems biology. Yes. And the thing that's fascinating about systems biology and systems biology approaches is that what we're trying to do is to build these complex mathematical models that allow us to make useful predictions about the way in which the elements in a cell interact with each other. How do the genes interact with each other? How do the genes and the proteins interact with each other? How do these epigenetic factors interact with everything else? In order to produce the cell types we see. And this is actually a complex question that is driven by the availability of data. Again, you know, I, I feel just so lucky. I always say, I tell people I feel like a big dopey kid uh, who's been fortunate enough to be given the opportunity to work on hard puzzles. Mm -hmm. And I think my background in training in physics has prepared me a lot of ways for that because we, we were always sort of taught to take puzzles, break them down, mm -hmm. find elements, and then put them back together. And we now have the data to look at cells, to begin to break them down, to look at the interactions, to put them together, to build models of how these pieces fit, and then ask, well, can the model predict something useful? So uh, we can look at perturbing the model of knocking a gene down or introducing a mutation and seeing whether or not we can predict what happens. Okay? We can often do that in fruit flies or yeast much better than we can in humans. Right? Fruit flies, um, their generational time is very short. Things happen very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so we have the opportunity to look at those. We can look at human cells in culture. But we can start to put these pieces together and then ask important questions. Because if we build models, they're not just toys for people like me to play with. But the whole point of building a model is to say, all right, in disease, if I have a woman with ovarian cancer whose tumors become chemotherapy resistant, if I can build the model and find out why exactly. it went right. over on that side, might predict. how do we push it back? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do we better? change cells from bad acting cells mm -hmm. to good acting cells. Mm -hmm. And so while the models may seem like a game, the mm. end point of that game is something which we believe is going to have a positive impact on human health. Right. Uh, so one last thing, Yvonne. Uh, we've been talking about this as if the genome is sort of a done deal. But I, I think the most exciting thing is that genomics is just beginning in a way. Mm -hmm. The sequencing the first human genome cost billions of dollars, but the cost has just been dropping dramatically as we've been developing new technology. And in fact, the cost of sequencing a human genome today is less than $10,000. If you look at the rate at which the costs are falling, the, the cost will be at $1,000 sometime late next year and $100 in 2014. And what that does is it changes the way we can think about human disease and studying human disease. But it also means there are a whole host of social, ethical, and legal issues we have to think about addressing. What will your insurance company do? What will your child do? What will anyone do as they get access to this data and information? But the thing that's important about the Human Genome Project is not that it's a historic relic, but it's something living and something that all of us, together, will have the opportunity to explore you've given us and I warmly recommend the book which is produced for general readers the human genome 
and just out the, this year. And uh, again, I thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's okay. been a pleasure talking with you. Okay.